Not the poor fuckers from Kazakhstan. They're going to make it. And what the Chinese like is it happens in China. The world's safe from China because nobody else, the Americans, the Germans, the Dutch, the Japanese, couldn't build the big arcs in time. It's only the Chinese. Oh, they say, of course, we can build the arcs in 19 months. No issue. No problem. So they build these five big arcs that are supposed to load so many thousand people each. So when the big 3,500 foot tsunami waves come, 3,500 feet high, when they hit everything, uh, and it's the Chinese, and when I, uh, my Chinese buddy, of course, he says, Dad, this isn't just a movie. We we're building spaceships up in the mountains, up in the north, so when, it, when the world ends, we're all going to go up into space. He says, not an arcs. The arcs is bullshit. It's spaceships, and it's not going to be thousands of people with things, it's going to be a few hundred. And I said, and what's it going to take? And they go, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take money. So unfortunately or fortunately, depending if you're a have or a have not, the people that are going to be, the only people to save humanity are going to be the rich people. With all their fucking inbreeding and all their, you know, the shit that's wrong with us. And not the Kaiserslautern, Bremerhaven, real estate flippers. Are they really building spaceships right now for, for, save, for saving myself? Saving them, not saving them. I'm worried about saving us, believe me. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Supposedly, yeah, that's, yeah, so that's, that's supposedly the big secret. Yeah. Yeah. Just in case all the shit, shit. Just in case the shit, all the shit's for real. Oh, the 2012 shit, huh? What? The 2012 stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's, they don't think it's going to happen in 2010. When it, but yeah. they, 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 supposedly, they've been working on it 15, 20 years. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. Wouldn't surprise me. Look at all the shit that was built that nobody knew about, you know, in the other wars we've been involved in. Look at it. Who's Saddam Hussein? <coughs> who's the president of Iraq? Saddam Hussein? No, no, not Iraq. Uh, Iran. Uh, 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 yeah. No, no, they don't have uranium. They're not making uranium. They're not making uranium. Then he says, yeah, we got a uranium plant here. Oh, fuck. How come nobody knew about it? What, what, what are the space satellites looking for? Oh, not only do we have one there, we got one there, well, we got one here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're not five years away. We got 22 pounds of that bad kind of uranium. Well, you know, of course, you know, everybody knows the U.S. intelligence is fucked. I used to be an intelligence officer. I know. You know, it's an oxymoron. But isn't anybody else checking them out? I mean... Now, I believe, and I'm not, you know, I believe that the Israelis are not going to wait until they get an atomic bomb. The Israelis will not wait for them. And they don't really give a shit what the Americans say, what Merkel <laughs> says, what anybody else says, you know. Just like they bombed their atomic plant 15, 18, 20, 30 years ago. And then all the, uh, all the Arabs are going to wiggle their ass and get mad, but it'll be too bad. Because the Israelis are not going to take the chance that... Those, that crazy guy gets an atomic bomb. Hopefully, the bomb doesn't. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think this, I don't think we have to hope too much. I think that's what's going to happen. That's what the has an accidental response. So. Yeah, well, or, or, and they're going to call it an accidental explosion. That's exactly what they're going to say. <laughs> ah, oh, the stupid, uh, the stupid uh, Iranians, they didn't know how to make the fucking bomb anyway. <laughs> that's why I blew up. <laughs> 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 to keep yourself motivated, a daily envelope stuffed full of cash is far more motivating than a a monthly salary, a yearly bonus, or watch the end of 45 years. Um, we, um, in a very serious organization, <laughs> uh, uh, built um, cash is the greatest motivator. It wasn't as successful in India because India, the Indians felt the need to have to collect cash. They didn't like that. If you put it in an envelope, they felt better. But handing out the cash, they didn't like. They didn't like. I'm not, I don't understand why. I really don't. Uh, but we adapted. It was easy, we adapted. Um, but um, cash at the end of the day, when we used to, uh, when I was a young man and I ran a, a sales deal while I was still going to graduate school in San Diego, uh, we um, had sales meetings, pictures of margaritas on Friday afternoons, and uh, I could hand out bonuses and cash to everybody, <coughs> and those guys would take a picture of margaritas and go right back up in the office to sell. The married guys, the single guys, everybody right up the cell, and they stay on the phone until people wouldn't answer the phones anymore. 
because at, at some now you can't just call people. You know, they got laws that you just can't cold call people in the middle of the night. But in those days, you could call anybody anytime. And uh, cash was the motivator. Most big mergers fail because they are trying to tack on new structure to existing strategy. Uh, this forces the strategy change to follow a new structure, which is wrong. Remember I told you, structure follows strategy. And when you do an acquisition, most acquisitions, the structures don't match because the strategies don't match. So you have to change one strategy to, to adapt to the, the new structure. And normally, uh, uh, not normally, it almost always fails. It also fails because of culture. And in most cases, we bring in Taylor, who can change the culture around in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in a peaceful, meaningful way, as his uh, uh, forebear, Dick Taylor, did. We get, we get him out of his box, <laughs> we brush back his cape, <laughs> shine up his teeth, you know? I mean, yeah. his hair only has to be a little longer to do it just like that. <laughs> you know? It, it's pretty close now. Now, we, can, we want to puff up the hog. So we want the business to look better than it is in, in a professional way. But we want to make it look better than it is. Before selling floating, floating means taking public a business, ensure two or three years of steadily rising profits. You always <coughs> want to sell a business when profits, turnover, are rising. It's called the hockey puck effect. Hockey, hockey stick effect. You know what a hockey stick's meant like? Like this? That's, that's what you want it to look like, hockey stick. Uh, not like most of yours, you know, limb dicks to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> Trim expenses, accelerate revenue. Not just on your spreadsheet, for real. You know, it's easy to do on a spreadsheet, you know, uh, but you want to accelerate revenues. Um, but then see, once the revenues are accelerated, then the owners think, oh, why should we sell now? <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm saving myself from bankruptcy. Why should I sell now? <laughs> the closer the, the compensation is the actual act which justifies it, the higher the motivation and the greater the impact for bonuses. There was a study done 15, 20 years ago at Harvard. If I remember correctly, it might have been Columbia. That quarterly bonuses have more impact than six-month bonuses, which have more impact than yearly bonuses. Because the closer the bonus is given to the actual act that created the bonus, <coughs> the sale or whatever, the more impact it has on the individual. So that's why daily bonuses are the best, weekly, monthly, quarterly, out to yearly. And I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how even guys that, you know, have family obligations, you know, you, you give them uh, cash on the Friday, they're out there until 10, 11 o'clock, trying to do the best that they very can, and they come back in on Saturday. Um, and um, some people, you know, you know, for me, uh, daily bonuses, every hour I wasn't selling something, I, I told you earlier, I had a 94.6% uh, closing ratio when I was selling real estate. 94.6% of everybody walked in the door where I sat down at the kitchen table I sold and I felt sick to my stomach about the 5.4 that got away from me. Because my expectations were high, because my old sales manager, Kelly Norwood, said, Pina, a young man like you, ought to close 100% of every motherfucker you meet. You're young, aggressive, you're good looking, and you got a big fucking mouth. And I felt bad for the guys that I did. So then the guys I ultimately trained, same thing, we ought to close 100% of every son of a bitch that walks through the door. Um, our sales figures went off the chart. Off the chart. Yeah. And now, when I told you, I look at 6% closing ratios and, uh, and even worse than that. I don't know what they're doing on the phone. I, I, I don't know what they're doing. Well, they're not selling. That's your goddamn shirt. So I don't know what they're doing. And I told you, my son, both of my, two of my children are very good on the phone. My daughter, when she was working her way to Boston University, worked for the alumni and cold called alumni raising money for the school. And most little girls, I mean, that would be a bad uh, call, you know, the only thing that wasn't a cold call is the people that had gone to Boston University, you know. I think she called Bill O'Reilly once, and she called, um, who's the guy, the real dirty guy on uh, the radio? Um, shit, I can't think of the 
guy that's on Fox now, the other guy on Fox. Not 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 uh, not not uh, Rimus, uh, not Dean uh, Rimus, um, Anyway, and uh, my other my other thing, my, my son it was very good, and he sold mortgages like we told you. And he used to make 120 to 150 calls a day, and he led the office. He was the first one there, the last one to leave. And uh, so you know maybe some of my genes got through to them that they being able to make calls. Uh, but and they and, and when I suggested to the owners of my son's business that they get bonuses no later than weekly, sales went up. Sales went up. You can puff up the hog, but only uh, if it's basically a good porker to begin with. You can't make a sub perso out of the sow's ear. Again, m many of us, myself included, we want more than the business is worth because we haven't taken enough money out. And that's why so many businesses, 95% of businesses that go for sale a year don't sell. House clean your business figuratively. People want to see something neat. Now most of the businesses I've visited in Germany are neat and clean. Yeah, they might, be run, they might not be run too well, but they're neat and clean. Things are neat when you walk through the office, they're clean. I mean, some of the machinery you, know, you can eat off of them, I mean, it's so clean. So uh, the Germans understand that for some reason. They understand that concept, neat and clean. Uh, but I mean, figuratively, there's a lot of businesses that I've also walked into that look, I mean, because then you think, if, the, if it's this fucked up looking, it's got to be fucked up inside. The financials have got to be wrong. Or the numbers, I mean, something's wrong. I have a question about this. Um, it's, I, I only know the situation from the, from the real estate, but I think uh, buying uh, companies is the same. Um, that the uh, employees are getting a little bit nervous when uh, two or three uh, uh, groups of uh, suit, suited and tight people yeah, are absolutely. inspecting the site <coughs> of exists and asking questions, and so they are nervous. Okay, well, I mean, there's two ways of handling that. Number one, you can say it's your bankers, uh, or it's just financial people that were looking for additional finance, which they are, you know, because uh, normally if I go in and I decide that I, can't, I don't want to buy the business, but I still think it may be worth a, 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 a financial investment. So, I mean, you, you're not misleading them. I mean, these are financial people, you know, we need more working capital, you want to expand, yada, yada. But you're not telling them it's going to expand without me. But, I mean, you're not telling them that. <laughs> you know, we're looking at Robert's business, the fact that Robert's going to be, you're going to tie him to a, a train and drag him off, you know, into the sunset. We don't tell him that part. Uh, but then if they ask Robert, what, what, what are they really doing, you don't lie to the people because that backfires. No, uh, I've decided that I'm thinking about retiring uh, and uh, these people are there. Uh, they're good people. Uh, they're going to give a, a fair price, uh, etc., etc. But you, you can't bullshit them. That's bad. Because you're right, they get nervous. And most people don't tell them anything. And that's wrong. Because then the worst thoughts come out. To, they think, oh my God, the business is going bankrupt. Am I, it won't be open tomorrow morning. And I've been in those business deals too. You know, the, the the seller waits and waits and waits and waits and tries to get a bit better deal and tries to renegotiate with the bank and tries to get some other potential buyer in. And then finally, they run out of cash and then they close the door. Then they come to me and they say, Dan, um, you know, uh, as as part of the purchase, can we make a deal that you do a bridge financing? Well, I already told you about my bridge financing. I mean, you might as well sell me the business. You'd be better off selling the business than a bridge financing. At least selling me the business, you're going to walk away with something. The bridge financing, I may foreclose on everything and take it anyway. Tidy up your office and the premises. Small images make a big impact when walking the uh, buyer around. Also tighten up and renew. Start contracts. Check suppliers. Are they loyal? Check your royalty situations, trademarks. Settle uh, pending lawsuits, clean up the financials. Be aware that any good due diligence will easily uncover clumsy efforts. In other words, clumsy efforts to try to cheat or whatever. I mean, and I'm surely not suggesting you do any of that stuff. But people will. Believe me, you try to buy something, uh, approach all the people you know in the same similar business, do they want to buy or your business? I've sold many businesses that I've been involved in to my competitors. Competitors. And sometimes they're even going, okay, I'm going to sell to Byron, but then I'm going to go to Stefan and Robert 
they were in similar business, and I said, Byron, I think we can make a deal. Not only can you buy me, but you can buy Stephen and Robert. So I go cut a deal with you guys, and I make it a bigger package, and he would have never thought about you guys, but I know, and so then all of a sudden, Byron's got a bigger deal, because I've added on two more complementary or supplementary businesses, yes. How would you approach a competitor to buy your company? It's just ringing and saying, well, I Yeah, 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 you, you just call up and you say, Michael, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we obviously know each other in the same business, can I come by and you know, have a cup of coffee? I want something I need to talk to you about. I'd like to talk to you about. And we, uh, I go by and I say, listen, I'm 64 years old, you know, I, I want to get out before I turn 66. And uh, I'm thinking seriously of selling, and I would rather sell to somebody I know. Uh, you know my business, you don't know the interest of the business, but if you're at all interested, you know, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, I might be able to both on step in and buy a buyer too, because over the last three or four years we talked to them, and um, the, uh, they probably like you more than they like me, and maybe, you, you know, uh, you had to deal with them easier than I could. Yeah, all the time it happens. How do you want him when you approach your competitor? He just uh, looks at all your documents and then gives you help? Oh, yeah, that, that happens. You, you, you get them to sign a non disclosure, which doesn't mean anything they can still yeah. disclose. Yeah. But I mean, that's a, that's a chance you've got to take. But you're trying to sell. You're trying to sell. Don't be so fucking proud and, you know, and uh, arrogant. You're the one trying to sell. And you want so. It, it, and that'll happen from time to time. You, you, make them, you, you, know, you have them sign a non disclosure. And that, you protect yourself the best you can. The best you can. Um, next, go through your accounts and lawyers. <coughs> accounts and lawyers, they're all well contacted. And you might know someone uh, who is interested. A good accountant can put your details on their internal computer system. This is another benefit of using a big firm. I've, I, uh, I think it was KPMG or might have been Deloitte. We were selling a business in Florida. Uh, and uh, we wanted um, to uh, sell. We went to our auditors. They put it on their uh, 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 intra intranet. Uh, intranet. And some guy popped up from Belgium. From Belgium! And the Belgium. Uh, uh, anyway, I won't say that they're funny, but they're, they're <laughs> really strange. Anyway, uh, and so they came down and they wound up buying the, buying the assets, buying the company. They've been looking, they wanted to expand into the United States, because I don't know this, it's not on the internet. And they had, had you know, they thought they were going to go into Chicago or uh, New York or Cleveland. And then, but they rather be in Florida where it's warm. Because in Chicago, New York, it's not much different than Belgium, the weather. And so the, they, they, they bought the assets and the, we were happy. Of course, the accounts charged up the ass on both sides. You know, For this, on the internet, the fee, I, I remember going to the, what? How's this, how is this possible? Am I, am I losing my mind? I mean, what happened? Is this a mistake? Is this, you know, and they said, oh, no, 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 but I mean, uh, it's for due diligence. You audited both companies. You're the fucking auditor on both companies. <laughs> what are you talking about, due diligence? Well, then he says that the, the, the uh, Belgium auditors had to come and look at the thing. All they did was sit by the pool at the hotel and look at your fucking numbers. What kind of audit is that? Anyway, we can be paid it. It was a good deal. But the, the, the big accounting firms love that. I mean, that, that's money for nothing. That, not according to them, it's not money for nothing. And of course, our name is on the note paper. We have both sides that we, we have potential liability to. Both sides. I said, you audited us 11 years, you audited them 29 years. Now, what kind of liability, what potential liability do you really have? Oh, Mr. Penny, you don't understand? I understand exactly. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, then, but anyway. If you sell, sell a business, uh I mean, of course, we want to sell at a fair price, but a fair price that's fair to you. And so if yeah, well, price I mean, a fair much. price to a buyer and a seller is never the same. Uh, there's always a spread. But somehow you get, you get in between, you know, you get in between. You Not make this concession. You know, you, know, well, you make this concession, they make that concession. You know, uh, the owner said he'd stay on 10 months. He wound up staying 15 months. Uh, he wanted his son to stay on the contract. His son wasn't on the contract. He wanted his wife to stay on the contract. The wife wasn't on the contract. 
so he and his son and wife been doing it anyway uh, to speak of, and so we were able to we were able to, to make it happen. Um, the um, but I mean your own professionals, but that's the reason for using a big firm. Big law firms can do the, the same, but it's easier for big accounting firms. It takes about one year from putting a business on the market to achieving a sale. Start early. And all you, what you'll see is we got six weeks, we got three weeks, we got five weeks. I've been where they say got five days. I've been where they got ten hours. Ten, and we closed. Subject to, we put the money up in escrow, and you know, subject to this, 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 and this. And the price is adjusted, and the big things that we're worried about, we say, okay, the price, if this is wrong, by less than this, we're going to reduce the price by 800000 If this day, one through point three million, if this is three million, and then we go, um, and then of course they say, what if we have more inventory? And I said, okay, well, they will pay for the inventory. Or I had, I had a guy, a partner, once said, keep the fucking inventory. You like the inventory so fucking much, you fucking keep it. <laughs> of course, you're not in the business anymore. So what are they going to do with the inventory? Yeah, and so they wound up, you know, we bought the inventory for 10 or 15 cents of the dollar. Uh, but it's inventory that we could have got from any place, anywhere. It's not a big deal. A big deal. And they were trying to make it a big deal just because they had too much inventory because the they, 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 inventory was choking them. In, inventory finance was choking them. So we basically paid the finance charges for their inventory finance and took the inventory. Okay. Taking it public or franchising it. I was the chairman of the fastest growing franchise company in the United Kingdom at one time. Uh, and we had offices in Portugal, I believe Germany, uh, Ireland, Australia, uh, Scotland, and England, and Wales. And um, I did, I had, before I got involved in that, I didn't know anything about the franchising business. I know a lot about it now, the hard way. I learned the hard way. Uh, and it, it's a great model. It's a great model. But you, it, entering the franchise business, uh, you got to have somebody that understands the franchise business. This is not a business that you want to learn on the job training. And we had the guy that set up McDonald's in Australia as a franchise lawyer, a British lawyer, a really great guy. Uh, but I mean, uh, the, um, we learned a lot of stuff the hard way. So our documentation was all nice. <coughs> But the actual operating guys weren't, because we, you know, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Um, and we made a lot of mistakes. And we priced, we priced most of our franchises so way too cheap. Way too cheap. And we finally figured out after about two years that we should have kept the key franchise areas like London and a few others for ourselves and had them owned by the company and sold the lesser franchise units out. We didn't do that. We sold initially all of them out. And so the guys, some of the franchises were making money like shitty money. I mean, they were just coining it. Bum, bum, bum. And the other ones that weren't were always complaining that we weren't advertising enough. We weren't this enough. We weren't that enough. You're taking 6% or 12 or whatever we took from the top revenue, and uh, you're not giving us enough. The other guys that were coining money couldn't give a fuck if we advertised anyway. You know, they didn't give a shit what we did. Just leave us alone. Let us run our business. Don't come and visit us. You know, don't come and have sales. We don't need your sales meetings. Just leave us alone. And we, so we had one end of the continuum. They were always on our back. We had another end of the continuum. They didn't want to talk to us. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and then we had a CEO founder who changed his mind. I told you the story earlier that uh, decided he didn't want to go public after all because he wouldn't be the CEO anymore. And... Uh, as far as I know, the franchise is still running. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What is your business worth? Now, uh, Bjorn's methodology is um, what the owner thinks he should get. Uh, the answer is uh, the amount of money the owner says he needs, or no, or the, or the answer uh, uh, is the amount of money uh, he or she needs to retire on. Neither answer is correct, uh, unfortunately, but that's how most people value of their companies. Um, the, um, what is your answer, uh, business worth? The correct answer is the current market is willing to pay down to and including nothing. 
I bought businesses for a dollar, a pound, a shekel. I have also bought businesses where they paid me ten thousand, a hundred thousand, ten million. I bought businesses twice, or as they would say in Texas, twice, twice. I bought it the first time when they paid me ten million, and then I leased it back to them, and then. I got it back again for the second time for three minutes. They paid me. That's how Kerry Packer um, in Australia made the largest single fortune in Australian history. Was it was it Packer when he sold um, PBL Publishing and Broadcasting Corp to um, uh, what was the guy's name? He, he he split from Australia, lived on an island. They tried to, to go after him. Scacy. Scacy, and then uh, yeah, he sold it to them for a billion two. Had a first right of refusal clause in the contract. The guy sends, you know, puts the company into bankruptcy within two years. Bought it back for a hundred million bucks. Yeah. yeah, and that happens. That happens. It's happened to me. Not enough big numbers, but pretty, you know, pretty meaningful numbers. And um, and but I also bought one of the best asset purchases I ever made was on New Year's Eve, when I bought great. Uh, uh, Western Energy, or no, no, uh, Legit Energy, from the Legit Company on New Year's Eve, which was a little UK company uh, that had been formed, that hadn't operated, but it had Bob Dyke on the board. It had all those heavy, heavy hitters that I told you about on the board. So I bought that board. And the only reason I bought the board is when Jack McLaughlin called me up at 10, 11 o'clock at night. He said, Dan, I need a favor from you. I said, what is it, Jack? He says, uh, I need to sell something tonight. I need to consummate it tonight for tax reasons. And uh, I said, fine. Well, what is it? And he says, it's this uh, legit uh, energy uh, UK limited or some bullshit. PLC, I think it was PLC. And I said, well, um, uh, you know, how much, uh, what, what kind of asset are we talking about? I already know. But he says, uh, at first we said, well, a pound. He says, no, how about 10,000 pounds? And I said, just, you know, does it have more than 10,000? I said, yeah, I'm almost positive it does. And so I bought it. It had a building on Curzon Street. It had a few hundred thousand pounds in the bank. Uh, and it had that board. And it had one of the best looking big titted receptionists that ever lived in London in the middle 80s. It was a great purchase. <laughs> and all the way around, it was a great purchase. All the way around, it was a great purchase. And um, the um, and then we, we, we got all I, I called my lawyer up or you know, both my uh, English solicitor and a uh, U.S. solicitor and I said this is what it is and they said okay uh, they got on the phone and they figured out how to memorialize it properly and uh, and that, but I was willing to do that one because who it's who you're hanging around with now nobody's going to call you in the middle of the night on New Year's Eve. Bjorn, I need a favor. Can you buy this asset from me? You know, I needed to get rid of it for tax reasons. And then they're the same guys I bought. The they paid me twice for the refinery later on. And, you know, I wasn't planning. It's not what I planned. That was not my plan. But be because the circle of people that I was running around with, and uh, the uh, when we were raising money for uh, um, drilling funds at the time, uh, a little later on, or about that same time, they used to send their um, G3 in those days, I think it was. And I, we, we used to classify as a jet, a real jet's a plane that a man can stand up in. And a G3, I can stand up, and there's that much room over my head. That's a real plane. Not one of these cocks up as you go, <laughs> like the hunchback in Notre Dame. You've got to walk around like this. And a real plane, a real man, this is Texas stuff, a real man has got a plane where you can take a shit. <laughs> And it's got a real fucking toilet. Not one of these pretend fucking toilets. That's a real man. And because of we were running the random of these guys, and we just, you know, I was exposed in a good way to those kind of opportunities. These guys were at Midlands Country Club, and they got tired to play golf every morning at 7 in the morning. They got tired of standing in line for the first tee box, first tee. So they built a fucking country club. 